Hello and welcome to another Ginger Mathematician video. So today I'm going to go through my predicted paper for paper four. So this is the two hour and 30 minutes paper and this is suitable for February 2024 and May 2024 as well. Again the total mark for this paper is out of 130 so slightly bigger than the paper two and again if you need any extra guidance again you can always use my all of IGCSE Maths playlist. Again I'll link that in the description as well and again all the standard instructions are right in front of you here as well right let's get started so we've got question one here so we need to calculate the volume we'll zoom in slightly of a solid cylinder with radius four centimeters and height 10 centimeters so we've got some volume 3d shapes to start us off now notice sometimes they actually give us the formula directly first so for a sphere but for a cylinder they would expect you to know this off by heart now the volume of a cylinder just to remind you is equal to the face of it so pi r squared the area of a circle and then multiplied by h so if we want to work this out here, we've got a radius of four and we've got a height of 10. So wherever I see a four, uh, R, I'm gonna put a four. Wherever I see an H, I'm gonna put a 10. So I'm just substituting R for four here and H for 10. And now I'm gonna to go to my calculator and work it out. Okay, so always make sure you've got your calculator handy for both paper two and paper four. So now we're going to just pop this in. Uh, to get the pi button here, generally it's shift and the button down here. So pi, then we're going to do four squared and then multiply by 10. Notice it often gives it to you in terms of pi, but if you press the SD button, that will convert it into a decimal. So let's double check we've got everything in there. Pi times 4 squared times 10. Then always make sure you've got the right numbers in. That gives us 502.6548. 502.6548. Dot, dot, dot. Generally speaking, you'll be expected to round to two decimal places. So rounding at this point. So we get 502.65 cubic centimeters. Now on to our next part of the question. So we have a solid hemisphere, that's really important, with a radius of four centimeters. Now the volume is given for a sphere. However, we have a hemisphere. Remember, that means we've got half of a sphere. So our usual formula, would be four thirds pi r cubed because we have half of that we want to use two thirds pi r cubed now our r here is just like the previous question it's equal to four so we type in two thirds multiplied by pi multiplied by four cubed at this stage this is just a calculator exercise again we've got a fraction button here so we can type in the two thirds directly times pi, remember shift and down here, times four cubed. Again, you can use a few different buttons here. I'm just gonna use this button to give me the four cubed. That gives us then something in terms of pi, but we can press SD and we work out 134.0412, 134.0412, dot, dot, dot. And if we then round that, of course, to two decimal places, we get 134.04 cubic centimeters. Notice both questions are volume, so therefore we need cubic centimeters as our unit. Now on to part B, which is a nice follow through. The cylinder, the hemisphere in that part A are now joined together. Notice the same values here. To form the solid in the diagram, and notice the solid is made of steel and one cubic centimeter of steel has this particular mass and we want to find out the total mass. Now notice they've given us a hint here, we need to use part A in order to work out the total mass. So the total mass is going to be the two answers we've already worked out. So these two things added together. So I'll just write this down for the examiner so they're clear exactly what I'm looking to do dot 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 plus 134.04 dot 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 so we go back to our calculator notice we can actually use our previous answer go to shift and answer and then we add in the other part Again, I'm trying to use as many decimal places as possible so I get the most accurate answer so we avoid those rounding errors if 
we add those together, we get 636.696. So let's just write that in. So 636.696 dot, dot, dot. Um, this is in cubic centimeters and the steel has a mass of 785 grams. So we need to then take our uh, total volume. So our total volume, and we need to multiply that by 785. So we can work out in grams, that is, uh, exactly how much the mass is. So we take our previous answer, again, using the answer button is really important. Stop any rounding errors. We're gonna times that by 785 gives us some big number, so 499806.4473. However, this is in grams. Notice the unit here being sneaky is in kilograms, so we need to convert from grams to kilograms. How do we do that? So we take our answer and we divide by a thousand. Remember, there are a thousand grams in a kilogram. And again, we can use the answer button that saves us a lot of time here. So we go shift answer, divide by a thousand, giving us our final answer of 499.806, dot, dot, dot. Again, we always round to two decimal places. So that's going to be 499.81 kilograms. Notice being really careful with no rounding errors and making sure we get the precise answer for the three marks. Now on to a related question. So 2000 cubic centimeters of iron are melted down and some of it is used to make 40 spheres with radius two centimeters. Calculate the percentage of iron that is left over. Again, we've got this key formula that we need to be aware of. So the first thing that we need to do is work out what cubic centimeters, 40 spheres of radius two centimeters would be. So if you work out the total spheres, let's put it that way, that will be equal to 40 times each of these spheres. Now a sphere is gonna be four thirds. Notice it's a sphere, not a hemisphere, times pi times two cubed. So we need to work out that uh, volume first. Again, back to the calculator, very heavily calculated question this. So we have 40 times 4 thirds. So let's pop in the fraction first. Times pi times 2 cubed. Again, it gives us something in terms of pi, but again, we can use the SD button to get 1340.412 dot dot dot, and that's going to be in cubic centimeters. And we need to work out what's left over here. So the way that we work out this percentage is we subtract one from the other. So we do 2000 minus the answer from before. Okay, divided by the total amount of iron, which is 2000, and then times by 100. Again, lots put in our calculator, but just need to be very careful how we do this. So let's have a fraction here. We have 2000 minus our answer from before. And using the answer button, really important, divided by 2000, that's our total amount of iron, and we want it as a percentage, not a fraction, so we times by 100. That gives us then 32.979 dot, 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 percent. Again, we always round to two decimal places, so we get 32.98% of iron left over. Okay, the iron left over itself is then made into a cube. Okay, that's interesting. So let's draw a cube out here. So the key thing about a cube is that all lengths are the same. So this is X, this would be X, and this would be X. So the general volume of a cube is just X times X times X, which is X cubed. And what's left over is made into this cube. So X cubed is equal to the 2000 
minus 1340.412. So let's just work out what that is first of all. So probably the easiest way of doing this is just take this away from the spheres that we worked out earlier. So a little bit extra work to do. You have two and a half hours for this exam. So take your time, absolutely fine to just repeat some calculations. That's not a problem. And let's make sure this looks like a sensible number. Should be around, yeah, 500 and something, 600 and something. So 659.587. Five, eight, seven, dot, dot, dot. We want to work out one length of this. So we want to work out the X essentially. Again, what's the opposite of cubing something? That's the cube root. So we need the cube root on both sides. This cancels giving us X. And now we want to find the cube root of this 659.587. And if we just find the cube root of that, then we can use this button here. And then we want the answer from before. That then gives us 8.7047. And again, we always do this to two decimal places. So it's going to be 8.70 centimeters for the one mark. <clears throat> Seems like quite a lot of work actually for a one mark here. But that's absolutely fine. If you had this in your calculator stored already, just find the cube root and boom, you've got your answer. Now on to the more AA star element of this question. So a solid cone has radius 3R centimetres and slant height 9R centimetres. So as I go through the question, what I generally do is just draw a sketch. So we have a cone. Let's just pop it over here. Again, my terrible drawings, but hopefully seems clear enough. And we have a radius. So let's get a different colour pen here. So... We have a radius of 3R centimeters and the slant height, so that's important, of 9R centimeters. Okay, then we have a cylinder. So we have a cylinder. Let's draw this out by great drawing. Came bottom in year 8 art a long time ago. Uh, that's a story for another day. All right, so let's pop this in. So we've got a radius of x, and the height is equal to 7x centimeters. And the total surface area, aha, surface area, is equal to the total surface area of the cylinder. Given that r is equal to kx, find the value of k. And we're given some useful formula here. So we're given the curved surface area of the cone is equal to pi r l. Okay, so let's start with the cone first of all. So the surface area of the cone, so I'm going to call this TSA, total surface area, is equal to the pi r l that we talked about before, about the formula that the curved surface area, so this bit going around here, but we also have to add in the base as well, and the base is just equal to pi r squared. Okay, so let's pop things in. So we have pi lots of 3r times 9r, okay, plus pi r squared, so pi times 3r all squared. Just popping these things in very carefully. That gives us then, we have 9 times 3 is 27, we have a pi and we have an r squared. And here, 3r all squared, be really careful with this, 3r times 3r, that's 9r squared. So we get 9 pi r squared. And we have 27 pi r squared and 9 pi r squared. That's going to give us 36 pi r squared. So that's our total surface area in terms of r. Now let's take our cylinder over here. So the total surface area of a cylinder, you may have learned a formula off by heart for this. Uh, generally, I tend to write it as... Uh, yeah, 2 pi r h, so that's the curved surface area, so this one here, plus 2 pi r squared, so that's the top part of the circle and then the bottom circle as well. 
So if we pop this in, I think it's my favorite word, pop this in. So the radius equal to x, so we get 2 pi x, and the height is 7x. And then we have 2 pi, not r anymore, but we have an x squared. So if we click this up, what do we get? So we have 7 times 2 is 14, 14 pi x squared plus 2 pi x squared. How many pi x squared? That's 16 pi x squared. So that's our total surface area now for the cylinder. And we're told that the total surface areas of the cone and the cylinder are equal. Therefore, we can say that this must equal this. And we want r on the left-hand side. So we have 36 pi r squared is equal to 16 pi x squared. Okay. Well, we can cancel out a pi from both sides. That's useful. Uh, we can take a common factor out of 4. So we can divide both sides by 4 here. 36 divided by 4 is 9. So we get 9r squared is equal to 4x squared. 16 divided by 4 is equal to 4. Uh, then we can bring over the 9. So we divide by 9 on both sides. That cancels giving us r squared is equal to 4 over 9x squared. And now we want to get the r on its own. So the opposite of squaring is square rooting. So we square root both sides. These cancel, giving us just r. The square root of 4 is 2. The square root of 9 is 3. That's a really good sign. We're getting whole numbers here. Don't have to, but good sign. And the square root of x squared is just x. So after all that very complex calculation, we actually have a very nice value for k here. It's just equal to 2 thirds. Okay, if you got that question correct, really well done, because that is a typical AA star question for volume and areas of 3D and 2D shapes. Right on to question two here. Now, if you're looking for some up-to-date revision day style material, I've just launched an IGCSE maths exam workshop. If you're interested in that, then do click on the link in the description. And again, I'll go through for about an hour and a half, five critical topics you need to know for paper two. Right, let's continue with question two here. First of all, we need to simplify fully. So some indices questions, which I do go through in that workshop as well. So here, remember, with small numbers with division, we are minusing the small numbers. So we have to be very careful here. 11 minus minus 3. Two minuses make a plus. So 11 plus 3. And that gives us f to the power of 14. Next question here. Again, we've got it as a fraction. We can simplify first of all. So how many fives go into 5? One, how many fives go into 15? Three, so we get three n cubed over n squared. Again, if we're dividing here, this is the same as doing three n cubed divided by n squared, similar to what we did in part one. n to the power of three divided by n to the power of two is n to the power of one, which we could just write as three n. A fairly generous two marks there. On to part three here, so we've got some negative indices. As soon as I see a negative index, again, we want to flip our fraction. So we get 25 over 49, x to the power of four, y to the power of six, and then we make it positive. That's how we deal with the minus. And now remember, the power of a half means the square root. So we want the square root of the top, and we want the square root of the bottom as well. So careful with our square rooting here. The square root of 25 is equal to 5. The square root of 49 is 7. Now this is where we have to be careful. If you do the square root of x to the power of 4, that's the same as x to the power of 4 to the power of a half. When we're working with brackets, we multiply the indices. So a half of 4 is equal to 2. So we get an x squared here. If we do the same process here, we just get y to the power of 3. So we have 5 over 7x squared, y to the power of 3. Again, you can pick up lots of marks by being really confident with your index skills. On to some quick bit of sequences here. So a sequence has the nth term a half n squared. Write out the first three terms of the sequence. So we want 
U1, U2, not the band, and U3. So, first of all, wherever we see an N, we put a 1. So we do a half of 1 squared. Well, 1 times 1 is just 1, and a half times 1 is just a half. So that's our first term. This one here, we want to do a half of 2 squared. Uh, 2 times 2 is equal to 4, and a half of 4 is equal to 2. And the last one, we have a half 3 squared. So we have a half times 9. Remember, 3 times 3. And that gives us just 9 over 2. We could write these as decimals. So if you wrote this as 0 0.5 and 4.5, that's absolutely fine as well. Now on to the nth term for each of these sequences. Again, whenever I see an nth term question, I'm always looking for the difference. That's the first thing I'm looking for here. Notice we keep subtracting 3 each time to get the next term. So our nth term will be minus 3 n because we have an nth term and what do we do to minus 3 to get to 13 we add on 16 so that will be our answer here how would I check this in the exam well if I put n is equal to 1 here 16 minus 3 is equal to 13 okay I'm getting the first correct first term here here we approach this in a very similar way so we look at the differences so we have a plus 14 here uh, at this point, you can start using your calculator if you're like, oh, 56 minus 18. It's a good exam tip. I mean, why do these mental methods when we just have a calculator? You can double, double check. So we have a plus 14, a plus 38, and then we've got these two. So we just find the difference. Again, under stress, just using your calculator effectively is really worth it. So we have plus 74. And then the last one. So we have 252 minus 130, we get 122. So we get these differences. Then we want the difference of the difference. So here we get 14, uh, difference between 38 and 14, that's going to be 22. The difference here, again, if you're not sure about this, you can always use calculator. We get 26. And here, Again, we're always double double checking these things okay that's why we double check so we get 36 and 122 minus 74 48 okay and then the difference of that is going to be 14 okay this needs to be 4 again this is why you have to be careful with these again just use your calculator the yeah, difference between this is 24 so we get plus 12 and plus 12 finally we get a difference so not a second difference but a third difference which rarely comes up but it's useful to be aware of now if you get a third difference you know it's got something to do with n cubed in so that's in my mind at this point and um, with third differences we divide by six that's important that gives us two so actually we should be thinking not just about n cubed but two n cubed so we need to think about the sequence of two n cubed so i'm going to write my sequence that i already have so let's just pop that in it's quite a tricky question Quite early on in the exam but we want to work out 2n cubed 2 coming from here n cubed from the third difference so again we want the cube numbers and then times by 2 so 1 cubed is 1 1 times 2 is 2 2 cubed is 8 8 times 2 is 16 3 cubed is 27 54 okay this is looking quite nice uh, 4 cubed that's 128 5 cubed, that gives us 250. Notice if we subtract the two sequences from each other, 4 minus 2 is 2, 18 minus 16 is 2, 56 minus 54 is 2. We keep getting 2 each time. So our nth term is going to be 2n cubed. So this part here. And then what we have to add to get to this sequence. So we get plus 2 there.
That's quite a tricky one. And again, there's something you should definitely work on. Uh, I find this gets undertaught, like most teachers are aware of linear sequences and quadratics, but qubits are also on the course as well. So question D here, we want to solve this equation. Again, standard procedure here, we have a divide by five, kind of annoying, so we want to multiply by five on both sides. This cancels, giving us three X minus three, 120 times five, that's 600. Then we just go through our standard process. We have a minus three, the opposite of that is adding three on both sides. Uh, this cancels, giving us 3x, get 603. Again, you could use your calculator at this point. You need to divide by 3 on both sides. This cancels, giving us x. If you divide this by 3 mentally or otherwise, we get 201, which will be our answer for 3 marks. Kind of strange that this question here is actually the same amount of marks as that cubic sequence we just did. Okay, and now we need to use the quadratic formula. Thanks for telling us in this question to solve 5x squared minus 2x minus 11 is 0. Again, giving the answer to two decimal places. Now, a quadratic formula is equal to minus b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, where this here is our a, this here is our b, and this here is our c. So let's substitute it incorrectly. So we have x equals minus b, so minus minus 2, that's positive 2, plus minus square root of minus 2 squared minus 4 times 5 times minus 11, all over 2a. Our a is 5, so 2 lots of a is 10. Let's just keep going through nice and smoothly. So we have minus 2 squared, that's equal to 4. This term is always positive, good to remember here. And then we have 5 times 4 times minus 11. So that gives us 5 times 4 times minus 11, minus 220. So minus, minus 220, all over 10. Be careful, this always has to be positive, they won't give you one. We get a negative square root. So if you're getting a negative square root, bad things are happening. Uh, this gives us 224 over 10. And now we want to work out the two answers. So x1 will be 2 plus 224 rooted over 10. x2 will be 2 minus root 224 divided by 10. At this point, this is a case of just putting it into our calculator and not making any silly mistakes. So we have the square root of 224 divided by 10 in SD to give us a decimal 1.696 so that's going to be 1.70 when rounded and we do the other one here so 2 minus the square root of 224 divided by 10 and again, SD button is our friend, and here we get minus 1.2966, that's minus, minus 1.30. Again, make sure your rounding is on point here to two decimal places. Okay, on to question three here. So the height of each 100 plants is recorded and table shows information about the height of them. And we need to complete the histogram again. It's a key topic, histogram, cumulative frequency graphs. Again, you're gonna see some stats in this paper for, for certain. Notice a little hint here is it gives you frequency density. So you use it as a trigger for the right thing. So notice the scale is quite different to the frequency that we have here. The easiest way of doing this is creating yourself an extra row and we need to work out the frequency density. The way that we do that, and remember this formula for FD, frequency density equals the frequency divided by class width. To keep that in mind here. So how do we do that? Well, we've got an eight here. The width here between 10 and 15 is five. So we do eight divided by five 
So for this term here, 8 divided by 5. Again, we use our calculator to get the answer of 1.6. Now notice I will double check this. So I'll look at our diagram and notice this does go up in 0 0.05s. So yeah, it is at 1.6. So we've got the answer right here. Here, this, the, the width here is equal to 10. Again, the widths do change here, so be careful. This is 15, this is 20, and this is 10. So 18 divided by 10, that's 1.8. Does that go to 1.8? Yes, it does. And now we continue in the same process. So we have 28 divided by 15. That gives us 1.87. Again, I'm going to double, double check all these things. Again, we've got 33 divided by 20. That gives us 1.64. Five, and then last one divided by 10 is 1.3 so if we want to draw this histogram here we want 1.87 so 85 1.9 so it's going to be somewhere in between here and we need to go far as cross as far as 40 gonna make your eyes dizzy on the screen much easier in real life and making sure I've got exactly the right one here yep so we go up to here come across and then using a ruler, which I'm not using here, but you should definitely use in the exam, that comes down to 40. Then we've got 1.65, okay, so 1.65, so we've got, this was 1.6, so it's just one up from here, and we're going across as far as 60. Try not to get dizzy when looking at this, so we go across like this, yep, and down here, it's double double checking, making sure you use a ruler, perfect, and then the last one is going to 70, 1.3, so that's 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and just goes all the way across to the end, which helps us a little bit with our drawing, so we get the three marks, just be very, very careful, and the key exam tip here is to use these values to check you're doing the right process and not the other way around. After this, we need to work out an estimate for the mean height. So the way that we do this is we work out frequency times midpoint. So I'm going to create a new com column here to represent what we have and pop this in. So let's have a look. We've got one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So we're taking the middle, so don't take what we just did here. We want the middle of this, so we've got 12.5, 20, uh, 32.5, 50, and 65. And we just do 12.5 times 8, so again, that's just going to be 100, but you can always check on your calculator. So we get 100 here. Next one, 20 times 18, that's 360. Some of these are nice, easy to work out. That next one isn't so easy. 32.5 times 28, 910. And last one, 50 times 33. Again, use that calculator effectively, 1,650. And then 13 times 65. Is 845. So we need to add up those values here. Notice I'm just separating these out into separate calculations. 150 plus 845. That gives us 3865. And to work out the mean here, or the estimate of the mean, we do 3865 divided by the total number of plants, which is equal to 100. That keeps our life easy. And if we divide that by 100, we get 38.65 centimeters as our estimate. Now, does that make sense? I'd always go back and double check 38. Yeah, I mean, it's generally clustered around the middle and more towards the top end. So more towards the end of the 40. So 38.65 makes logical sense. If you're getting something sort of ridiculous like 3.8625, that doesn't really fit the data that we actually have here. So 38.65, 
I'm happy with that particular answer. Okay, and on to question four here. So Clara here is playing a game with these six number cards. So we've got these six number cards in front of us and she takes two cards at random. This is really important phrase, should probably be in bold, without replacement, so not replacing them, and adds the two numbers to give a score. And we need to find the probability that the score is equal to eight. So we could actually write um, a big diagram out here, but let's just think about this a bit more logically. How can we actually achieve eight here with only two cards? Well, we can certainly do three plus five, that's equal to eight. And of course, we need to consider the other way around as well. Is there any other way of actually getting eight here? And these are the only two combinations available. So we need to work out the probability of three and five, and then add that to the probability of five and three. Well, the probability of getting a three, that's gonna be one out of six. And then the probability of getting a five here, and we've taken one card out already, because there are only five cards left, would be one out of five. Notice, whichever way around we do this, it doesn't actually make any difference at all, because there's one of each card here. And if we work out these two fractions, one out of six times one out of five is one out of 30. So we get two lots of one out of 30. That means then we get two out of 30. Remember, adding fractions, you add the tops together and that simplifies down to one over 15. I do recommend you do keep your probabilities as fractions. Again, it'll just keep things a bit easier as we go through the question. Next question, I like this. It seems similar, but actually there's a nice little twist here. The score is a positive number that is above zero. Now notice here, with only two negative cards and four positive, that's a lot of different combinations to work out. So let's take a negative approach to this, which is we can do one minus, remember all probabilities add up to one, the probability <coughs> that the score is zero or less. That's gonna make it much easier to work out here. Now let's think about what's the probability of score zero or less. So which combinations will give us either zero or less than zero? Well, certainly minus two and two and the other way around, that gives us zero. Um, minus three and three and the other way around also work. And of course, don't forget we can get minus two, minus three and the other way around. And finally, we can also use minus three and positive two and the other way around. So in, a, in total here, we actually have eight different combinations that would give us that particular answer. There's nothing else that will work here. For example, if we did three and minus two, that still gives us positive one. So notice here we have eight different combinations. Each combination will just be one over six times one over five, just like we saw before. So each of these combinations has a one in 30 chance of occurring. So we've got eight of these, so the probability will be eight over 30. Notice much fewer than working the other way around. So our answer here is gonna be one minus eight over 30. Now we can use a bit of fraction work here. One is the same as 30 over 30 we minus eight over 30, giving us 22 over 30, or we can simplify this down to 11 over 15. So it's important with these kind of questions, I like this question, uh, thinking in a more positive way, adding combinations or subtracting combinations from it. Now our last question is now Regan, should be Clara, and now takes three cards at random from the six cards without replacement and adds three numbers to give a total. Find the probability that her total is equal to five. So again, we need to think about combinations that give us five from three cards and exactly three cards. Well, notice we've got these minus two and plus two, minus three and plus three. So the way we can achieve five is either minus two, minus three, and five. Or we can also achieve five. So minus two, minus, minus two, plus two, and five. Or minus three, plus three, and five. That's the only ways we can get those combinations. Now let's have a think. The probability of getting a minus two, a plus two, and a five 
Well, that's going to be 1 over 6 times 1 over 5. Remember, we're not replacing here, so times 1 over 4. If we multiply this together, we get 1 over 120. Again, that's going to be exactly the same for minus 3, plus 3, and 5. We still have 1 over 6, 1 over 5, 1 over 4, which is 1 over 120. So our answer here will be, just be those two combinations and all the different permutations added together. So we get this, giving us two lots of 120, which is the same as 1 over 60. I like this question because generally they give you a tree diagram or a sample space diagram to work your way through. However, here, thinking about combinations, again, which is also a skill on the IGCSE course, is a more effective way to get to the correct answer. Right, on to our next question, which is, looks like a circle theorem question, but it could be something else here as well. So, ABC are points on the circle, DE, the line at the bottom, is a tangent to the circle at C. Show that angle ABC, ABC, is equal to 70.2 degrees. Okay, so we're looking for this angle. That's a kind of our question mark here. Okay, well, if we draw this out separately, so ignore the circle for the time being, if I just draw this out, we have 10 centimeters here, we have 7.7 .7 centimeters here, 9.5 centimeters here, and we're looking for an angle. Let's label this up A, B, and C. Okay, that means then that we've got three sides and looking for an angle, we're gonna be using the cosine rule. Again, being able to recognize that is very, very important. Now. Generally, you're given this formula here, minus 2ab cos c, but a rearrangement is very helpful here. So cos c, this is generally the way I'd recommend to do this, it's a squared plus b squared minus c squared over 2ab. So that's the formula we're going to use. However, we need to recognize which side is which. So in this particular situation, we're looking for this angle. This one opposite is going to be our small c and the other two sides make up our small a and small b. So we pop this into our formula, so we get cosine of c equals 9.5 squared plus 7.7 .7 squared minus 10 squared, all over 2 times 9.5 times 7.7. .7. And of course c is going to be the cos inverse cosine of what's above here. Remember the opposite of cosine is inverse cosine on both sides. So let's go to the calculator and work this out. So make sure it's in degrees, otherwise bad things will happen here. So let's get our fraction ready. So we have, well, so 9.5 squared. And just be really careful as we pop this in plus 7.7 .7 squared minus 10 squared two times 9.5 times 7.7. .7. It's gonna give us some horrible decimal, that's right. Then we'll do inverse cosine of this answer, shift answer. And that gives us 70.207 which if we round this gives us the answer that we're looking for. I love these show that questions, they're great. Give you four marks on this is quite generous. But again, some students may have to rearrange the formula rather than knowing this formula off by heart, which for IGCSE, this will save you a lot of time to know that off by heart. So from that, we need to work out some variety of different angles. Let's pop in this angle first of all. So we're told this here now is equal to 70.2 degrees. And let's work our way through. So angle AOC, AOC. So this angle here. Okay, so we need to remember the rule that the angle at circumference is twice the angle at the center. So to work out this angle here, we just take our original answer, 70.2. Again, this is why they've done this. Even if you've got this wrong, you can still use this. So we can times that by two. Let's give us 100 and 40.4 degrees. So I'm just going to use the angle just in case I did get that wrong later on. So that'd be 
0.4 degrees. Here's obtuse angle, that makes lots of sense. Then we've got angle ACO, so ACO. Okay, so here we have an isosceles triangle. Notice these are both radiuses or radii of the circle. So to work out these two angles here, we just do 180 minus the 140.4 dot dot dot. Let's quickly do that on here. So 180 minus 140.4, which gives us 39.6 degrees. And then because isosceles triangle, we divide that by two. And that gives us 19.8. So we'll leave that as 19.8 degrees for that angle. And then we've got angle ACD. ACD, this angle here. What do we get that as? 19.8. And now we need to remember the rule that a tangent and a radius meet at a right angle. So we need to do 90 minus the angle we just worked out. Let's so they do this in order to help you through the question. So we take our previous answer, 90 minus 19.8 degrees. And that gives us 70.2 degrees. So let's pop that in. And one more question, it shouldn't be anything too complicated to get to the answer. Okay, and from there we need to calculate the radius of the circle. So we need to calculate OC here. Right, so here we've got, this is also 19.8 degrees. We've got this here at 10. So what's coming to mind here is the sign rule. Um, notice we've got an angle on the side, another angle, and we're looking for this side here, OC, which is a radius. We could also do OA as well. So if I draw this out as a separate triangle, probably makes it easier to visualize. So we have a triangle that looks like this. We've got this at 10 centimeters. We know the center angle is 140.4. four degrees we're looking for this side let's just call that a and we know the side the angle opposite is 19.8 degrees so to use the sine rule we do a divided by sine of the angle opposite so 19.8 degrees and that's equal to 10 over sine 140.4 degrees. Again, yeah, we want to make A the subject here. So what's the opposite of time? Uh, dividing by sine 19.8, no, I'm going to say times by sine 19.8. That gives us 10 sine 19.8 degrees divided by sine 140.4 degrees. So let's pop that into our calculator. Uh, let's use the one on screen to say know where the sine button is. So fraction button. 10 sine 19.8 divided by sine 140.4 gives us 5.314 dot 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 and that's uh, rounds into 5.31 centimeters again it seems a reasonable length as well if we look at the diagrams not to scale of course it says here but yeah this to be five centimeters yep that could certainly be fine now we need to calculate the area of triangle ABC as a percentage of the area of the circle okay so we'll probably need to use this unrounded version a bit later on so the area of the circle that's just going to be pi r squared, so pi times this 5.314 dot 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 squared. So we'll work that out in a moment. And now we need to work out the area of triangle ABC. Now we've got lots of sides of ABC. Uh, ABC, yeah, just using this angle and then these two sides make a lot of sense here to work out the big triangle. So we're going to use half AB sine C here, which is a formula you need to know. And that means we're going to do a half times 
Let's see which sides we're using here. 7.7 .7 and 9.5 times the sine of the angle in between, which was the 70. 70.2. Okay, and then we need to work those out. Um, and to work out the percentage of the area of the circle, so the final calculation here will be area of circle minus the area of triangle divided by the area of the circle, because the circle is bigger than the triangle here, and then times by 100. Notice I haven't really rushed to my calculator. I'm going to set up my working nice and neatly and use the calculator in one fell swoop, in one action, essentially. So if we pop this in, we get area of the circle. So that's shift pi times. Now, the answer to this 5.314 is our radius. So we can go answer squared minus the area of the triangle, so that's 0 0.5 times 7.7 7 times 9.5 times the sine of 70.2, close bracket. Then we want the area of the circle, so that's just, put this in brackets to be sure, pi times, again, the answer squared. Those brackets, and we want a percentage, so we times this whole thing by 100 at the end, and we get 61.211. So this works out the percentage that's not the triangle. So to work out the percentage that is the triangle, then we just do 100% minus our answer. And that will give us percentage of the triangle, so just 100 minus answer, 38.8%. That's to 1 dp. Probably should do this to 2 dp. 38.79 for them, 38.79 for the four marks. Okay, on to some vectors here. So we've got P and Q given, and we need to find 3Q. So 3Q is going to be three lots of minus two, five, so we times both numbers by three. That gives us minus 6. 5 times 3 is 15. And then we've got something like a mixture of. So we've got 2 lots of 3, 4. Minus Q, so minus 2, 5. So we just times each of these numbers by 2. That gives us 6, 8. Minus, minus 2, 5. Now be careful here. 6 minus minus 2, that's equal to positive 8. 8 minus 5 is 3. So be always, always very careful with your negative numbers here. And then we have these lines here. This is basically looking for the magnitude of the vector. And this is a formula you can just learn off by heart. So remember our p vector is equal to 3, 4. So the magnitude of the vector will be the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. So it's just Pythagoras essentially. This gives us then square root of 9 plus 16, which is 25, giving our final answer of 5. Again, this is a one mark question, one mark, and then two marks <coughs> for knowing the magnitude of a vector. Now, this question is quite a nice one here. So B is the point 3, 4. Now, I always draw a diagram just to get an idea of what's going on here. So we've got 3 and minus 4, so something down here. <coughs> Excuse me. And AB, so the vector AB is equal to 2 minus 7, and we need to work out the coordinates of A, so going from A to B. What would be more useful for us is knowing the vector B to A. And all we need to do there is just switch the signs. So we need to do minus 2 and plus 7. Now remember, the top number tells us to go 2 to the left. The bottom number tells us to go 7 upwards. So all we need to do from here 
is go two to left and then seven upwards to get our new coordinates. Well, three minus two, that's going to be equal to one. And then minus four plus seven, that's equal to three. So our new coordinate for A is going to be at one, three. Again, you could always check this by actually just doing the vector A to B. One plus two is three. Three minus seven gives you minus four. And on to a very typical vector algebra style question here. So in this triangle, we've got M as the midpoint and K divides the line GH in the ratio seven to three. So what that means is here, this is seven tenths of the line and this is three tenths of the line. The vector OG, so this entire vector here is equal to G. The vector OH going all the way across is equal to H. And we need to find the vector MK. Okay, so probably the easiest way to work out MK is to go from M. Hmm, probably going from M to H and then H to K. So that's what we're looking for here. Before we can do any of that, it'll be useful to know what the vector HG is. To go from H to G, well, we need to go minus H and then minus G. So we're going from H to O and O to G. Notice the arrows that go in the other direction. That's why we've got some negatives there. So the vector HK, that will be 3 tenths of what we just said. So minus H minus G. And then the vector MH, because this is the midpoint, this vector is going to be a half H. So we just need to work out then a half H plus 3 tenths of minus H minus G. Got a bit of fraction work to do here. So a half H, remember we multiply like a single bracket, so we get minus 3 over 10 H minus 3 over 10 G. Notice here we can simplify the h's. Uh, one half, of course, is equal to 5 over 10. So 5 over 10 minus 3 over 10 is 2 over 10. We're not quite finished at this point because 2 tenths is the same as 1 fifth. And so we get our final answer for mk, which is 1 fifth of h minus 3 tenths of g. Okay, and on to a very typical functions question here. Okay, if you want any um, help with this particular kind of question, then do check out the video above where I go through all of IGCC functions in about 40 or 50 minutes. Right, so let's go through this. So find f of 2, and we're given all these functions at the top here. So if I want to work out f of 2, wherever I see an x, I'm going to put a 2. So I'm going to copy out that function, this part on the right-hand side. And wherever I see an x, I'm going to put a 2. So we get 2 times 2 here. And that gives us then 5 minus 4, which is equal to 1. So very standard one mark question there. And now we need to use a little bit of composite functions here. h of f of 2. So we now know what f of 2 is equal to. So we now know it's equal to 1. So if I take h of f of 2, I can replace this part here, f of 2, with just 1. So I want you want to work out h of 1 here. Well, if I put uh, 1 into the x here, I'm going to get 3 over 1, and that's equal to 3. So it's a very standard question, a little bit of D, E grade stuff, and then we go straight into the C and B grade. Now, find x when f of x is equal to 10. So I make this whole function equal to 10. That means 5 minus 2x is equal to 10, and then I just solve it from there. The plus 5 is kind of annoying. What's the opposite of adding 5? Well, minusing 5 on both sides. This cancels, giving us minus 2x. 10 minus 5 is 5. And now we've got a minus 2x here. So we want to do the opposite of timesing by minus 2. We want to divide by minus 2 on both sides. That gives us x is equal to 5 over minus 2, which we could write in lots of different ways. Minus 5 over 2 is my favorite or minus 2.5, that is also fine as well. And now we need to find x when h of x, so let's take our function, so 3 over x, that's h of x, 
is equal to g of 2. Now, if I've got g of x is equal to x squared, well, g of 2, that's going to be 2 squared, and that's equal to 4. So essentially, it wants me to work out here 3 over x is equal to 4. We can do a little bit of rearranging here. So I'm going to times by x on both sides. Gets, gives us rid of the fraction here. So this gives us then 3 is equal to 4x, and therefore x itself must be equal to 3 over 4. So don't be afraid in these function questions. When you get fractions, that's perfectly normal. Now, the next part is this j to the power of minus 1. j inverse is the better way of saying it. So we want to find the inverse of this function j, which is 2x plus 3. So we have a three-step procedure. First of all, we make the function equal to y. Then we switch over the x's and the y's. And now we want to make y the subject. Easiest way here, we're going to minus 3 from both sides. That gives us x minus 3 is equal to well, this cancels, so 2y, and then we want to get the y on its own. What's the opposite of timesing by 2? Dividing by 2, so we get y is equal to x minus 3 over 2. So that's going to be our inverse function. Again, that video I recommended earlier, again, I'm going through this quite quickly, but again, I'll go through this in a lot more detail in that video. Now, a little bit of algebraic fractions here. We need to write f of x plus h of x plus 2 as a single fraction in its simplest form. So f of x is equal to 5 minus 2x. h of x is 3 over x. And then we have a 2. The key strategy here is to get the denominator the same to everything. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply top and bottom here by x, kind of unsimplifying the fraction. 3 over x I'm going to leave alone. Again, I'm going to unsimplify by put 2x over x. Notice I could simplify back to our answers, but the key point here is that we have x in the denominator of all of them, which means we can just add the tops together here. Nice and straightforwardly over x. Again, we just need a little bit of expansion and simplifying here. So we get 5x minus 2x squared plus 3, plus 2x, all over x. If we simplify this down, we have a minus 2x squared that stays as it is. 5x plus 2x is 7x, plus 3, all over x. And we have it as a single fraction, tick, in its simplest form, also tick as well. Now it gets a little bit trickier, a bit more unstandard here. So f of x all squared minus f of f of x is some quadratic, and we need to work out the quadratic here. Okay, so f of x first of all. Let's just write down what that function is equal to. That is 5 minus 2x. Floating <laughs> equal sign there. So f of x all squared, well, that's just 5 minus 2x all squared. Now, f of f of x is where it gets a little bit confusing. So f of x itself is 5 minus 2x. So we want to work out f of 5 minus 2x. A bit inception-like here. We're inserting into this x a 5 minus 2x. So we get this. And then a little bit of expansion here. We've got 5 minus 10 plus 4x, which we can simplify to minus 5 plus 4x. So we have 5 minus 2x all squared minus minus 5 plus 4x. So we just need to expand this out. Remember, squaring something, you times it by itself. With this minus here, this applies to both. So we get a plus 5 and a minus 4x. Expand this out. Standard procedure, we get 25. Uh, minus 20x plus 4x squared plus 5 minus 4x. This then gives us 4x squared minus 20x minus 4x is minus 24x. 25 plus 5 is 30. So we need the a, the b, and the c here. That gives us then 4 minus 24 and 30. And the last thing to do here is to find x when the inverse is equal to 10. So we go back to our h function, which is 3 over x. 
There's a couple of ways you can do this. Again, we could just find the inverse function like we've done before to get y equals 3 over x. We swap over the x's and y's and make y the subject. If we do this, actually, we we'll get exactly the same function. So it's an inverse of itself. And all we're saying here is the inverse, which is actually itself, is equal to 10. So then we just solve the equation. And a quick solving of the equation here gives us x is equal to 3 over 10. Again, there's another way of doing this as well, but again, let's stick to the standard methods that we already have. Okay, question eight here. So a triangle, got a 3D uh, kind of problem here. Dry diagram shows triangle ABC on horizontal ground. So ABC is the, the flat, so to speak, and then it's going upwards. BP and CQ are vertical poles of different heights. That's important to know. This is four and this is three. And AQ and PQ are straight wires. First thing we need to do is show the angle ACB, so the angle right down here, is equal to 117.5 degrees. This is almost identical to a question we've already seen and give you lots of marks of this kind of question. That's why I'm popping it in. So this would be then 15 centimeters, or oh, meters, sorry, 15 meters, eight meters, and 20 meters. We're looking for this angle. Okay, we've got that situation of three sides and looking for one particular angle here. So we need to use the cosine rule from before. Again, just a quick reminder of what it looks like here. And notice this is the angle we're looking for. So the off side opposite is small c, the other two are a and b. So we can actually work this out in one calculation, do it slightly differently than what we did before. So we have eight squared plus 15 squared minus 20 squared over two times eight times 15. So this is where the, aha, you can see me straight. Um, this is where the calculator comes in handy here. So we go to inverse cosine, so shift and here. Then we're going to set up our fraction. So we have 8 squared plus 15 squared minus 20 squared all over 2 times 8 times 15. All we have to show is this working and you'll get all the marks. There we are, 117.54. Dot, dot, dot. And that will round to exactly what they've given us here in the show that question. Now we need to calculate the area of triangle ABC. Now we know this angle is 117.5 degrees. We can use the triangle formula. So that's a half AB sine C. Make sure the A and B are exactly the same as what we've used here. So we have a half times 8 times 15 times sine of the angle in between. Again, we just pop this into our calculator. I'll do it on this one here instead. So we have 0 0.5 times 8 times 15 times the sine of 117.5. That gives us then, double double check, putting everything in correctly. 53.2206 dot 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 and that gives us 53.22 square meters okay and next question calculate the length of a q so that's this side up here notice we just have a right angle triangle here so if i draw oh that's a bit weird uh, if i just draw this in that's also slightly weird. Let me get the rubber out. Whilst I'm fixing this, feel free to like the video. It helps to spread to more people in the YouTube universe. So here we are, this is four meters, this is 15 meters, and we're looking for this. So here we just got a standard Pythagoras. I encourage students just to go directly to this. So just like it's a magnitude of a vector, for example, and just type this in directly. So the square root of four squared plus 15 squared. Okay, if we go to our calculator, we can just go shift four squared plus 15 squared. Again, SD button is our hero here, 15.524 
do, do, do. So two decimal places, 15.52 meters. Now we need the angle of elevation of Q from P. So let's just work out exactly where that is here. So the angle of elevation of Q from P. So we start at P. Imagine I draw a line all the way across here. And we're looking for this angle here. So it's important to identify what angle we're looking for. This is a right angle here as well. Now, if this height is three and that height there in total is four, then this small height here, it's going to be equal to one meter. And we know already that this is eight meters. It's the same length as down below. So essentially, we've got a triangle. And it's always good to draw it out separately here. So if I draw it out, where our height here is one meter, this is eight meters. And we're looking for this angle here. So if we want to use Sokotoa, that's probably the best way here. We've got the adjacent side next to the angle, because this is what we're looking for, our question mark. This is going to be the opposite, so we're going to be using tan here. So tan of the angle, let's just call it theta, is equal to opposite over adjacent. Remember your Sokotoa. So that's going to give us 1 divided by 8. And we're looking for the tan, or sorry, the theta. So what's the opposite of tanning an angle? Yep, we want to inverse tan on both sides. So theta is going to equal tan inverse of 1 over 8. So we just pop this into the calculator. Make sure you know where it is. So shift, tan, and then generally put this in brackets. Again, you can do it as a fraction or a decimal. But 1 over 8, pop it in. And we get 7.125 degrees. Again, I'll just do a double check here. I'll put this in. Does seven degrees make sense in the context of the question? So if this is one and this is eight and this is long, then that's probably going to be a small angle. So that makes some sense. Always do a, a common sense check here. So 7.125, so that gives us 7.13 degrees. Now, another straight wire connects A to the midpoint of PQ. Okay, so let's pop that in. So PQ is here, and another line is connecting up here. Okay, and I assume we need to work out its length or something like this. Uh, angle between this wire and the horizontal ground. Okay, so it hits here. We've got a horizontal... Yeah, so we want to create this right angle triangle here. And this is going to hit here like so. What do we know so far? So if it's halfway or the midpoint up, this length up here, it's going to be halfway of three and four. So this here is going to be 3.5 meters. Uh, we just need to work out one more bit of information. The one that comes to mind here, because we're looking for this angle here in particular, so let's call that theta. Uh, probably the easiest thing to work out would be this length down the bottom. So it's the midpoint of PQ, it's going to be the midpoint here as well. So we end up essentially with a right angle triangle. If I draw this out, well, this is half of eight, which is going to be equal to four. This is 15 meters. So again, we're using that, exploiting this idea of the midpoint, midpoint here, and it's going to be the midpoint down here as well. So this is four, this is 15. Once we've worked out that side, we can use this side as well to then work out the angle. So first thing we want to do is work out here. So this is going to be this length. It's going to equal the square root of 4 squared plus 15 squared. Again, this can just go into the calculator. We'll get something in terms of a third. So yeah, the square root of 241. Now we look at the triangle we're actually considering here, where this bottom length is what we worked out. This here needs to be 3.5 meters, and we want to work out the angle between it. So again, we're going to be using tan because this is the adjacent, this is the opposite, and this is our theta. So tan of theta 
the opposite 3.5 over the root of 241. So theta is going to equal tan inverse of 3.5 over root 241. And we pop this into the calculator. If there are any errors that you spot in this video, please let me know. I can do an update. And that. Three point five. Okay. And that gives us yeah an angle of twelve point seven zero five, and that simplifies to twelve point seven one degrees to two decimal places. Okay, on to question nine here. So we can sketch the following graphs. In each sketch indicate any intercepts with the axes. Okay, so the, the kind of cheap way of doing it here, of course we could put it into y equals mx plus c form, but we can also use this idea. So when x is zero, so when we put x is zero in here, then we're left with minus 2y is equal to 10, therefore y is equal to minus 5. So we know the point 0 minus 5 is on here, and we can do it the other way around. So when y is 0, 5x is equal to 10, therefore x is equal to 2. So we know the coordinate 0, 2 also exists. So we go 0 minus 5, that's going to be down here somewhere. We know 0, 2, so it's going to be a fairly steep line like so, and we can then just join them up. Again, we put in the intercepts, which is the most important part here. We actually have to write on, strictly speaking, what the gradient is here to get the two marks. Uh, this one here, again, we want to sketch our quadratic. Again, first of all, we know that the y-intercept is minus six, so we can pop that down here. To get the x-intercepts, we just solve our quadratic, so we make it equal to zero. This is one that factorizes. So what two things multiply to give you minus six, add to give you minus one, that's going to be minus three and plus two. Therefore, x is three and minus two is our solution. So we've got three here and then minus two here. We know it's a positive quadratic, so it's going to be an n-shape or u-shape, sorry, and then we can just connect everything up here. So we get a graph. The minimum point, by the way, will be down here somewhere. And then we come upwards like so. Strictly speaking, we don't need to work at the minimum point, but we could do that through differentiation as well, or the axis of symmetry. Uh, for this question here, so again, very useful tip here is when x is 0 to see what happens. So y is equal to 2 to the power of 0. That's equal to 1, so it's going to go through at 1, and because this is a positive and also greater than 1, we're going to get a graph that looks like this, where we have an asymptotic behavior that never actually goes below the x-axis. Okay, from here, they want us to do some differentiation, which is an important topic, particularly towards the end of the paper. So find the derivative of this particular function. So to work out a derivative, any numbers, they will just disappear. You can ignore those. Uh, then we look at the 8x. So if it's a, just an 8x to the power of 1, we just read off the constant in front. So that's just 8. And then to differentiate this, again, remember your differentiation rules. Take the 3, bring it to the front. So we get minus 3 times 4 thirds, and then reduce the index by 1. So we're going to change that to x squared. We get a nice cancellation here. So that's going to leave us with just 8 minus 4x for our derivative. And now it wants us to work out this derivative. So it's the same function at x equals 1. So we want to work out the derivative and x is equal to 1. So we just substitute 1 in, just being careful of negative numbers. Minus 4 times minus 1 is plus 4. And that's going to give us the answer of 12. With a weird moving 12. There we are. 
<laughs> okay, uh, next part of the question. The tangent is drawn to the graph, so it's the same function. Always double check. The gradient of the tangent is equal to is minus 28. Find the coordinates of the two possible points where this tangent meets the graph. Okay. First of all, we need to be careful. I just realized in the previous part, I'm getting tired at this point, um, this should be a squared, of course. So when we actually put this in, let me... Notice the reason that I, I checked this and found this out is because two possible points. We need a quadratic at some point. Notice when I substitute this in, I didn't get a quadratic. So I had to be very careful with this. So let's go back. This is a good uh, show of double checking and making sure you go through your work carefully. So 4x squared, so 4 times minus 1 squared, so that gives us 8. Minus 1 squared is 1. 1 times minus 4 is minus 4. So yeah, it does give us 4 here. And now it wants us to work out the two possible points where the tangent meets the graph. So we take our derivative. And we want to find out when this gradient is equal to minus 28. So essentially, we need to solve this equation here. So if we minus 8 from both sides, we get minus 36. Again, we can divide through by minus 4. It gives us x squared is equal to 9. And therefore, x is equal, and this is where to be very careful, plus or minus 3. So our x coordinates will either be minus 3, or they will be plus 3. Okay, now we've worked out the x-coordinates, we need to work out the y. So we take our original function, so y equals 5 plus 8x minus 4 over 3x cubed. And work out the y-coordinates for both. So when x is positive 3, y is equal to 5 plus 24 minus 4 thirds 3 cubed. This simplifies to 29 and 3 cubed is going to be positive 27. Get a cancellation. It gives us 29 minus 36, which is minus 5. So our first coordinate will be 3 minus 5. And we do exactly the same process for minus 3. So when x is minus 3, y is equal to 5 minus 24 minus four thirds, minus three cubed. So that gives us minus 19. Uh, this is gonna give us minus four thirds times minus 27. You can still get the same cancellation. Minus four times minus nine is positive 36. And that's gonna give us positive 17. So we get minus three and 17 and just being careful as you go through the algebra go through your substitution making sure you get to the right answers okay and the last question here so another differentiation question so for the function we need to work out the stationary point or points and whether they are maximum or minimum again a much more advanced skill on the IGCSE course so as soon as I see the word stationary points we need to differentiate so I'm going to work out f dash of x here so 3 comes to the front, reduce the index by 1, 2 comes to the front, minus 5 times 2 is 10, reduced by 1, differentiate here, and we get a plus 3. Now we need to set that to 0, so stationary points, we want to let the derivative f dash of x equals 0 here, so we get 3x squared minus 10x plus 3 is equal to 0. And we hope it factorizes, that's always the hope here. And we get a minus 3 and a minus 1, so that works very nicely. So therefore, x is equal to 1 over 3 or 3. So those are the x coordinates of our stationary points. However, we do need to know what the y coordinate is. So when x is a third. Uh, y is equal to one third cubed minus five lots of one third squared 
plus three lots of a third. So that's going to give us one over 27, one over nine minus five over nine plus one. Again, I just used a calculator at this point to simplify here. Again, no reason to do anything else. So we've got one over 27. Your fraction is very good at simplifying these things for you. So five over nine plus one, that's gonna give us then 13 over 27. And when X is equal to three, three cubed minus five lots of three squared plus three lots of three gives us 27 minus 45 plus nine. Okay, I think that's nine. You have to be careful of tiredness in this exam. It's two and a half hours. So you do have to be very careful. So that's minus nine. So we have the two coordinates. We have one third, 13 over 27 and three and minus nine. Now it's kind of a lazy way you can actually do this. Um, if you take a general cubic, so a general positive cubic, it always has this particular shape. So I, the, minimum, uh, the maximum comes first, and then the minimum comes second. So if we take our coordinates, the third needs to be the maximum, and three needs to be the minimum. And it makes sense from the Y coordinates we have here as well. Um, the official way of actually working this out is working at a double derivative. So if we differentiate this again, so this thing here, we get 6x minus 10. And then if I put in, for example, when x is 3, so this is what I said was the minimum. Okay, a little bit of lag. There we go. So when x is equal to 3, so if I put this in the double derivative, we get 18 minus 10, which is 8. And because this is greater than 0, it must be a maximum. If we put a third in, you'll get the other way around, and that will... Apologies. Greater than zero, <laughs> therefore it's a minimum, and if you put in a third, there'll be less than zero, and therefore it will be a maximum point. Okay, hopefully that was helpful to you. I did speed through some of the last parts of this paper as well. Again, if you want to go through anything, or you spotted a mistake, I'm always happy to hear about those in the comments. And if there is a mistake, I will make an update to this paper. Right, absolutely perfect. If you want to review all things paper four, and you think you need a bit more practice paper four, getting yourself ready for those exams, then check out the video right in front of you, where I go through that over about two hours, those really, really important topics.